he was introduced to a fellow called Liam Lawler. Okay, Liam Lawler, who would be Liam Lawler, the late Liam Lawler, who died in 2005, tragically, uh, said to Gilmartin, because he had heard about him in advance, as had many other politicians, he said, uh, I'm here to help you. The government uh, has asked me to assist you in relation to Bachelor's Walk. Um, Gilmartin said, listen, I, I want to know about the landowning in Quarryville. That's why I'm meeting you. You're the local politician. Yeah. And immediately Lawler demanded a 20% stake in the action. And within a week, uh, uh, he, he bulldozed his way into a meeting of Arlington Securities, the company that, that, Tom, uh, that was backing Tom in the development of Bachelor's Walk in London, arrived, plunked himself down and said, I'm, a, I'm, I'm here on behalf of the Irish government, and immediately demanded, as I say, a share of the action. What did he look for from Liam Lawler, cash-wise? What did Lawler look like? Sorry, what did Tom Martin, Martin look for from Liam Lawler for, in terms of... Uh, or sorry, what did Lawler look for? Yeah, Excuse yeah, me, quite yeah. right. From, uh, Gilmart, from Tom, Tom Martin. Uh, Lawler wanted the company to pay him uh, a, a slice of the action, as he called it, 20%, which potentially, if a site would develop to become worth 100 million, would be a huge amount of money. Um, uh, and the, the Arlington people eventually agreed to take on uh, Lawler as a, as a consultant which, where they would pay him three and a half grand a month, and that went on for about 11 months. But more importantly, again going back to Quarryville, uh, Lawler also introduced uh, Tom Gilmartin very soon afterwards to the then assistant city and county manager, George Redmond, mm -hmm. in his offices, the council offices in, in O'Connell Street. And again, during that meeting, as I say, a couple of weeks only after he'd met uh, uh, Lawler, he meets Redmond, and in the course of that conversation, Liam Lawler says to Tom Gilmartin, in order to get a map showing the identity of the landowners of Quarryvale, you'll have to pay me 100 grand and uh, George will want 100 as well. Okay, so welcome to Ireland, welcome that to the planning process. That was his first experience of, of, and the, the, of, of, of this type of, uh, of, of corruption where okay. people were hitting him at every turn. Which was, in a way, council-wise, low level, uh, at least uh, from a political side, low enough level with Liam Lawler and then, but... Uh, high enough level with George Redmond. But I want to go back to you, Thomas, and to mm. the time and the moment, critical moment in this story, when <coughs> your father met Charles Hoy in Leinster House. Can you recount that story for us? Yes, he was uh, told that he, uh, that the boss wanted to meet him, and he was brought by Liam Lawler into the door. And they went up to a, a, a room on a, a floor, which is disputed, but uh, in the room, anyway, he met several uh, cabinet ministers very briefly, uh, including Bertie Ahern, Albert Reynolds, Brian Lenehan, uh, Ray Burke, Mary O'Rourke, and Charles Hawhey. Um, the there was some, yeah. uh, Then the Taoiseach. The, the conversation was just, um, it was minor chat. There was nothing major in it. Um, and uh, as he left, uh, Hawhey asked my father, I hope, uh, is Liam taking good care of you, as in Liam Lawler? Mm -hmm. I thought it was an odd thing to say. Anyway, outside the room, as he left the meeting, uh, a man approached him and said, hey, you're going to do very well out of this, um, you know, and we'll expect to be paid. My dad was taken aback. He, he thought this was some kind of joke or something. And we being? We, uh, we don't know what he meant. Um, it, uh, it could have been connected with politics or it could have been connected with someone. But you don't know. But a man know. outside the Taoiseach's office A man office directly said. outside. Yeah. Um, he said, um, we want five million deposited in an Isle of Man bank account. And he gave a piece of paper with a number on it to my father. And uh, my father said, are you serious? And he said, yeah. And he, my father said, you people make the effing mafia look like monks. Um, to which the man responded, you could wind up in the Liffey for making a statement like that. Uh, anyway, my father left. Within hours, he had told a number of people, including um, John Fortune of IBI and others, about it's this bankrupt. demand. Yes. And uh, <coughs> anyway, within a few weeks, uh, there was there were more uh, games being played by George Redmond and Liam Lawler, stopping investments um, and uh, screwing up meetings that were supposed to be held with roads engineers and others because they weren't getting paid. And so my father made a complaint to Sean Hawhey, who was an honourable man, even though he was Charles Hawhey's brother. Son, yeah. Um, no, his brother. Brother, his brother. Sorry, brother. brother assistant assistant city manager. Yes, assistant city sorry, manager. My, my apologies. And uh, uh, he, uh, he was taken into the guards, and yes. he told the whole story, all the demands for money that had been made, and this particular incident. And where did it go from there after a guard complaint? 
Uh, he was interviewed a few times on the telephone. Uh, one night he received a telephone call in Luton at home from someone purporting to be uh, a Garda Burns. Uh, we don't know whether it was a Garda or it wasn't, but he was told to stop making allegations of this nature against people whose names will emerge unsullied and unscathed and F off back to England. This was the guards in the country. He'd gone to the police. He was essentially crying for help at this point because he was being messed around at every corner by corrupt politicians and officials. And this was the response that he, we believe came from the your, guards. Your father met with the, the Minister for the Environment at the time. That's right. Walter he, Flynn. He uh, met with Flynn. He met with several uh, government ministers. Uh, several of them said, well, you know, these games that are, you're complaining about, they might stop if you uh, consider making a donation to the party, to the Fianna Fáil party. And my father refused many times. Anyway, when it came to May, beginning of June, the games were continuing. Uh, Redmond was uh, still um, messing up meetings and so on. And uh, my father, pretty much in a state of desperation, with the police force of the country not prepared to help, the government not interested, uh, he said, OK, I have to do this. He met Michael McLoon, the chief valuer of Dublin Corporation, that day, and he said to him, should I do this, shouldn't I do this? Uh, McLoon said to him, well, they'll take your money and they'll do nothing for you. And he said, but I've got to do something. I have to do something. I'm, I'm being destroyed here. So he went and he met Flynn. And well, that's, why don't you take it there, Frank? Because he, yeah. he, as, as Thomas <coughs> has been saying, Mr. Martin went to Porrick Flynn, and this was, again, a critical point. What it is a very critical point, but it's also critical because it was actually during the famous 1989 election campaign. And we know from the other modules of the tribunal that other Fianna Fáil ministers at the, uh, it, during that period were, were taking monies wherever they could get them, uh, um, including the former minister, Ray Burke, of course. Um, it was Ray Burke who ended with the police report on his desk, and it was never seen again until uh, Tom Gilmartin, until the tribunal discovered Tom Gilmartin in 1998. So, Tom decides that he's going to make a donation to the party. He heads up to the Custom House, which is the department where, where Flynn had his uh, department uh, in Dublin, uh, the Department of the Environment. He goes into his office. Flynn is, is wrapping up for the day. It's in the early evening, end of the week. And as I've said, it's an election campaign. Um, Tom says, I want, to, I want to make a donation to the party. I'm trying to get my projects going. I'm told this is the only way I can do it. Excuse me. And uh, he says, who do I make it out to? I'm going to give £50,000 to, to Fianna Fáil. Flynn says, oh, well, that's grand. I'm in a terrible rush, and he's packing his bag. He's heading off to the west to, camp, to, to canvas. Uh, just, just, just leave it blank. It's grand. We'll sort it out. And uh, as a result of that, and possibly uh, naively, Tom Gilmartin left the payee on the cheque blank and filled it for 50000 And we know subsequently that that, uh, that money ended up in, in the former minister's um, personal bank account. So it was, as I say, uh, an election period. It was several months later, uh, several years later indeed, mm -hmm. that he discovered in, in late 1990, the following year, that the monies hadn't actually been received by the party because he, he, he met senior party officials. And, and who kept asking him, when are you going to make a donation to the party? He said, I've made one. I made one to, uh, made one to, to they fall back in 89. It, there was no record of yeah. it having been received by the party. So, respectfully, I put to you that you know, your dad did sign a cheque for 50 grand to pay Fianna Fáil to get stuff done. I mean, you don't pay 50 grand just for the good of your health. Um, I mean, he, he, he did sign a cheque to a politician for what could arguably be said was a favour. Um, well, only if you believe that the favour is being put in the position you should be in legally. Sure. Um, he was being subjected to an extortion racket. The government of the country was being run as an extortion racket. Um, to, to say then, well... Mem members of the government or the government in its entirety? Or? Uh, not, no, th I, there are decent people in, uh, in, in all parties and in, in that government there would have been decent people too. Uh, there are, there's a certain cabal within the government right. involved in this kind of activity. The, the, the Fianna Fáil party at that time was pretty much hijacked by a small group of people so, of that nature. Right. Uh, this didn't just happen, it, it affect your father's business in Ireland because the British revenue started 
sniffing around, if you'll excuse the expression, your, your, your home in the UK. What happened and when? Uh, this is a little later, at the early 90s. This is at the right. point where the AIB and uh, others had become involved in, this, in mm -hmm. the uh, project. Um, my father had been forced into um, a minor sh uh, stake in the, sh in the company. In his own company? In his yeah. own company. And um, among many uh, things done in order to try to take over control of the company and to force my father out of the company, um, one of them was that uh, false information was given to the Inland Revenue in Britain that he owed this huge amount of money in Dublin. Mm -hmm. The Inland Revenue t uh, in Britain told us the information came from Dublin. And, and what uh, impact was that to have on your family's circumstances? Uh, devastating. And not only was it a false demand, uh, my father was made bankrupt. Uh, when they called at the door, the Inland Revenue, the media were waiting, again on a tip-off from Dublin. And uh, they knocked the door in and knocked my mother to the ground. She had multiple sclerosis. Um, <laughs> and the, the Inland Revenue apologised and said, we had nothing to do with the media, we don't know why they're there. Uh, there were stories in the newspapers planted from Dublin about this huge tax bill. We were made bankrupt, we had no money, my father couldn't draw the dole. Uh, my mother, as I said, had multiple sclerosis. Um, she was struggling every day to try and put food on the table. Often we had no food in the fridge. We, um, we were struggling, we were living off handouts. And my mother um, collapsed under the stress and she has never recovered to this day. She, uh, she was put under extraordinary stress. I remember that period very well. It was not pleasant. Uh, now, I don't want to make out that this is, you know, that we uni uniquely hard done by it. We live comfortably before that. We live comfortably since that. But in this period, it was very, very distressing. But you're associating everything what was, what was happening essentially in Dublin. <coughs> It was what connected was, in some way through sinister, shadowy activities. What from, was being done to my family in England was being directly orchestrated from, from Dublin. Dublin. Frank, if we go to fast True. forward again to 1995, to that ad in the newspaper, which again changed things an awful lot when mm. looking for uh, information that would be useful uh, regarding corruption in the planning uh, area of planning, uh, that was something that would move the story on considerably. Well, obviously, that was a huge uh, breakthrough, and uh, I actually was introduced as the result of that ad to, uh, to Jim Gogarty, uh, who's also died since, and uh, he was the one who gave me the information about the, the, the check, famous check, again in that same period during the election of 1989, yeah. where he was present in a room when, when he said Ray Burke received two large amounts of money from two developers. And, and Tom Gilmartin wasn't going to get involved in all of well, this Well, Tom didn't know anything about it. Yeah, the, the, this, this led eventually to Burke's resignation, as we know, in, late, yeah. in 1997, and the setting up of a tribunal. Um, the Taoiseach, then new, newly installed Taoiseach, Bertie O'Hearn, announced the setting up of what was then known as the Flood Tribunal. And they started to look for information. The first major module was about Ray Burke and yeah. associated issues, including uh, Frank Lawler, Liam, Liam Lawler's activities, etc. But they then discovered in early 1998, only months afterwards, the Garda report from 1990 that had never been disclosed. And they found the allegation made by Tom Kilmartin to the guards mm -hmm. that he had been hit for money left, right and centre. Mm -hmm. And they saw the words in the, in, in, in the statement that were made and they went and checked out Tom. They found Tom Gilmartin through actually a priest, a friend of one of the lawyers in the tribunal uh, in Luton, met him. And Tom explained how he had been told by, in a phone call from a man who claimed he was a Garda, that these people will emerge with their reputations unscathed and unsullied, as Tom said earlier on. The, law the lawyers were looking at this. That was the exact words used in the, in, 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 in the Garda report. Yeah. So, of course, they knew this man clearly had been wronged and they followed the trail from there. And he ended up giving evidence. The impact of Tom Gilmartin's evidence was what? How would you characterise it? Well, I, I, I spoke to him first in, la in, in late summer of 1998 and uh, all I could say at, after an hour's conversation, if a portion of what this man is saying, this is even bigger than the, than the Burke story. So, so how did Bertie uh, O'Hearn come into the equation? Well, <clears throat> as it turned out and as Tom prepared very carefully his legal submissions to the tribunal, his affidavits to the tribunal in those months of 1998 and 1999 uh, <clears throat> and subsequently in the course of that he made another allegation that he had been told by a developer uh, that monies had been paid sums of 50,000 in 1989 and 30,000 in 1992-93 uh, 
to Bertie O'Hearn. Both denied by... In connection with the Quarry Vale Yeah, denied by both parties, and yeah. Of course, they, 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 they denied it. And, yeah. and it. But it led to the tribunal going to Bertie O'Hearn and seeking his finances for those particular years yeah. when he was Minister for Finance between 1987 and, and, and 1990. And we know what happened. And, and of course, that, on, that. That, 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 that threw out all him. sorts of unexplained finances. Yeah. But it did for him, It did indeed force eventually his, his resignation from, yeah. from office. You were there with your dad every day. He, was, he, he gave evidence for three years. Uh, what impact did it have on, on the man psychologically and physically? Um, if he was nervous, he wasn't showing it. I was more nervous than he was. I remember driving down the night before from Cork uh, with him before we first gave evidence. And I said <coughs> to myself, what are we letting ourselves in for? Who's going to believe us? Yeah. Uh, you know, we're taking on the most powerful interest in the country. No one is going to believe us. This was at a time the Celtic Tiger was riding high and... Um, you know, no one would believe any wrongdoing could be done by banks or, you know, senior politicians. Uh, when we were in there, the very first day, uh, Liam Lawler went on a tirade against my father. My father just treated it as, you know, water off a duck's back. It's right. you know, of the nature of the man. Um, but the ongoing process, it was very strenuous for him. Um, it, he had a quadruple heart bypass in 2004. I do believe that the, the ongoing stress, not just inside the tribunal, but the, the, the campaign of ridicule and demeaning against him by senior members of the government, uh, by uh, certain client sections of the media, who one or two had been bought off, um, they, uh, they really set about him. Even questioning by lawyers for Bertie Ahern at the time when they questioned uh, my father's mental health which I consider to be low-life stuff. Um, this kind of thing, uh, it, you know, the, my father felt this was demeaning to him. He didn't need to be there. He was happy and he didn't want to see the sky over Dublin again after he got out. Mm. He, he was, there was nothing in it for him to be there. Uh, but he decided he was going to see the whole thing, thing through. And I do believe that the stress and the, um, the, uh, the circus around it <coughs> contributed to his death in uh, last year. Yeah, your, your dad died, was it just six months ago? Uh, five months ago, five November months 2013. Ago. Condolences to you and, and your family on, on, on the passing of your father. And when you think of the stress that you've just been talking about and uh, your, your mum's Ill, Ill health, um, was it worth it? Do you think it's a family? Do you think you, it was worth everything that happened? On one level, I persuaded my father to do it. I persu uh, the, everyone was telling him not to do it in February 1998. I persuaded him to do it. Uh, on one level, it was worth it. There was a, a certain catharsis for him to get it out there um, and to tell the story. Um, there, his, his evidence led to the downfall of um, you know, um, various politicians, the exposure of a corruption ring on Dublin County Council. It was him who first exposed Frank Dunlop to... to uh, the tribunal and all that fell came from that. So that was a direct result of my father saying, look at this man. And from that point of view, yes. But from another point of view, when you look at Ireland now, where are the prosecutions? Uh, you know, no one's been prosecuted for perjury. No one's been prosecuted for, for corruption. Um, you, I look at Ireland and I think that uh, the rule of law has huge gaps in it. It's one thing to be a young man um, to, you know, to steal a pair of trainers or to have a bit of cannabis on you or something, then you'll have the book thrown at you. But if you're a senior politician or a banker or whatever, um, <coughs> you seem to have a level of immunity. No one, no one is interested in looking at these things. Chris, you mentioned the figures uh, at the beginning of this item, about 15 years of a tribunal, 200 million euro in cost. Uh, do you think justice was served? Well, I... I think we've learned a lot, you know, we've learned that we weren't as well off in Ireland as perhaps we thought we were from the point of view of morally and, and uh, religiously. Yeah. Um, so uh, also if you compare those figures to, to where the state has ended up and the debt we have, mm. it's, it's minuscule, you know. So uh, you think it was worth it ultimately? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I do think so. I mean, we hope that we're in a better place now. We hope that if, if Tom Gilmartin was to arrive in Ireland today, we hope that he would be embraced by the politicians and encouraged and helped to achieve what he sought to achieve yeah. instead of 
they buried him. Do you believe he would be welcomed and encouraged in that I way? Or do you, hope. you hope. I, I appreciate that, which yeah. is very different to believing it, it being the case. I don't really know what to believe yeah. anymore. It's a day-to-day -day thing, you know. Okay, I understand it's, that. It's, um, we hope. Yeah. We hope that things will improve. Uh, yeah. But when, when I, I think of what Thomas's family have been through, I mean, really, he's, he, he, I think he's the main man to... Do you want to finish by saying something? I was just going to say, I think what happened to my father was also, it was um, uh, indicative of the culture of contempt for emigrants and for uh, people who come from an Irish background but live abroad in this country. If my father had been famous, he would have been welcomed by open arms, if he'd been powerful or, 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 or famous, but he wasn't, and he was treated with contempt because he was an outsider. He's been described as a whistleblower. He wasn't a whistleblower because... You need to be an insider to be a whistleblower. He was an outsider. He was treated with contempt because he's an immigrant. And I'm not sure that someone from that background, you know, I think that they should think very carefully before investing in okay. Ireland. I think what's, more, what's very important okay. in all of that is the fact that this period of Irish history, and uh, that period during the 1980s yes. and into the 90s, uh, I believe is where the roots of our current crisis uh, are found, where the seeds were sown, where that culture which involved uh, bad management by politicians, a, a, a banking system that was not regulated, uh, a close connections between senior people in politics and in banking and other financial areas. That is the root of how we've got here today. And in Tom Gilmartin, his evidence and what he did with Thomas in coming to the tribunal played a, a huge part in exposing. Uh, it didn't stop the rot from destroying the lives of so many hundreds of thousands of Irish people, but it was an attempt, a brave attempt, and indeed the tribunal investigation proved that it was an attempt to show that there was corruption at the heart of politics. Okay, Frank Connolly, thank you very much. Christy Moore, thank you very much. And Thomas Gilmar, thank you kindly thank you very, very much for coming to see And the book is called Tom Gilmartin, The Man Who Brought Down a Taoiseach and Exposed the Greed and Corruption at the Heart of Irish Politics is out now. That's it for part three. Plenty more to come. We'll see you in a few minutes' time.